real uh, the, the real show. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Chris Bowser, um, and uh, it's great to see everybody here. Familiar faces, new faces, that's fantastic. I'm very fortunate to get to straddle a bunch of organizations, including the DEC's Hudson River Estuary Program, the Hudson River National Estuary Research Reserve, and of course, the New York State Water Resource Institute. Um, special show, words and pictures mean a lot. And special shout out to uh, the, the Water Resource Institute, uh, WRI, for this great logo here. Look at this great logo here. And I, what, I love the, the what, what to me is a multiple meaning here. I see both a valley that kind of leads to a riverbed, like a watershed, but I also see the, the open pages of a book. And I love that because a lot of people will tack on education to like their action agenda as like, oh, we're going to do all this great science stuff. Oh, yeah. And we'll throw in some education, too. But I like that WRI is leaning into water literacy as a key core foundation to what it does. So shout out to Brian Rom um, or whomever came up with that great logo. Shout out to Brian Rom for okaying it at the end. <laughs> so that was fantastic. Uh, my contact info is here, but I can put that in the chat box as well. Um, I am also fortunate to work at a beautiful place called the Norrie Point Environmental Center. Here's a picture uh, from two nights ago, um, working late. And I said, oh, this is going to be perfect to put in my presentation. And, um, uh, you know, working in the throughout the Hudson Valley and the Hudson River watershed, uh, it's good to acknowledge um, uh, that, you know, many people, many cultures have been through the Hudson Valley and we are in the ancestral homelands of, of indigenous peoples who still maintain a very tight connection with their river and with their lands and waters. I want to uh, make a special point. Remember, we talking about how words and pictures count. I love um, the Mohican word for what we call the Hudson River, what I call the Hudson River sometimes, which is Mahia Kani took, or the waters that are never still. And I, I just, I love that leaning into the fact that the Hudson River is an estuary. The Hudson River, you've got the rise and tides, the ebb and flow. You've got so much going on and it's a dynamic system. It isn't static and learning isn't static either. And environmental education isn't static either. It is so wonderful to work on and within the waters that are never still and the people of the river are also never still, which really gets into how we like to think about, um, about our, our programs. And I, I forgot to mention, by the way, one of my colleagues who's joined in here, who's, who's pictured here, this is my good friend, Maya. And um, she's standing next to another great WRI uh, uh, invention, this water drop that is all about promoting water literacy. So Maya and myself and our whole team, we like to think of our programs not as sort of the traditional corporate ladder of, you know, let's climb the rungs, but we like to think of, of our programs as more of stepping stones that students or teachers or anybody can take to experience their river. You can, and but the thing about stepping stones is you can start somewhere and go left, right, back and forth. Sometimes you fall into those waters that are never still. You climb back up and you keep going. And um, one, of the, one of the things that we uh, have been doing the longest is one of our stepping stones is this idea of discovery, this idea of making programs that will give very often students their first experience in a um, uh, uh, in, in their waters at their shorelines, one of our programs called Day in the Life of the Hudson Harbor is a prime example of that. And there's a lot of different Day in the Life models in the Great Lakes and the Niagara River and the Bronx River at, at, at Coney Island Creek. Um, basically, the idea of these Day in the Life of the River programs is many students or multiple students from multiple classrooms coming down and studying their river all on one day. So, you know, all up and down the Hudson River every fall on this one day, we will have students down in New York City seining for fish, 
uh, underneath a bridge. We will have students at Norrie Point putting on their lab coats and looking at water chemistry. We will have students um, at a waterfront using, um, exercising their artistic talents to paint and interpret what they, what they, what they see. And the beautiful thing about these programs is we try to make it so that they're very much teacher driven. It does, it, it, they're, they're, they're very much for a wide diversity of students, a wide diversity of ages, a wide diversity of topics that are covered, and um, a wide diversity of sort of abilities in terms of what your site looks like, the kind of equipment that you have. We try very much to have something that for everybody involved is going to be a fun experience. And even if a high school student versus a fifth grader versus a kindergartner has a different experience, that's okay. Somebody on a city pier may have a different experience than somebody on a, on a, on a beautiful preserved park somewhere. Neither, no, none of those experiences are better or worse than any. It's all capturing this Hudson River estuary system. It's all part of these waters that are never still, that are constantly in motion. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed with our programs is that over time, these day in the lives, these are great. And our field trips that we have at Nori, these are great, but they're very often these sort of initial experiences and carrying on those experiences is sometimes hard to track. Now, once in a while, we get these wonderful anecdotes. Just like a, a couple months ago, I'm with our Hudson River Fisheries crew on the waterfront in Austin. And we were just, we were doing hardcore science, pulling up nets, counting the fish, throwing them back, going to the next site. A young man walks up to me, walks straight up to us. And he goes, you know, a lot of people don't know that this river is tidal. And I'm like, really? Tell me more. And he's like, this is actually not even a river, it's an estuary. And I'm like, really, tell me more. And he's like, yeah, when I was a high school student, my teacher, Bridget Kenny, she brought us down here and taught us all about the river. So this young man here, Yamadine Brown, he was a participant in Day in the Life years ago. And just by randomly happening down at the waterfront, and he's educating me and our crew about everything he knows about the river. And I mean, I was like the Grinch at Christmas. My heart grew three sizes that day. It was fabulous. Um, another uh, cool example of that is, um, this is uh, Jennifer Rosette. She works for the uh, Columbia Land Conservancy upriver. She was also a day in the life participant uh, many years ago as a student. She then went to college. She is now a professional environmental educator who leads her own groups to go down to the river and participate in day in the life of the Hudson River. So we have these wonderful like stories of students who have gone on to do more things. But I have to say that in a lot of my career, we haven't done as great a job of either building those stepping stones or sort of almost, if not tracking, at least looking at and trying to study what parts of those stepping stones work the best. Now, um, thankfully, you know, things are changing over time. So in two examples, one, my colleague Maya, who we saw a picture of earlier, ha has designed a great program uh, at Nori Point where we're actually trying to encourage high school students and undergrads to take on a slightly deeper uh, research program in the summer to sort of move from that discovery into that into that personal research and personal story. I know Marissa, uh, who's also uh, on this call right now, she participated in a very similar program uh, in Rockland County with uh, Lamont Doherty. So these programs are terrific. And this is, this is the perfect sort of lean into turning it over to Megan, who I love this project because Megan is trying to, to go from beyond like, the goofy Chris Bowser, oh, let's just go play in the water with kids and, and hopefully have some great times. And she's really trying to put some academic chops behind this idea of student engagement, of how do we keep students involved who want to be involved? How do we make sure that the best stepping stones are available for the people who want to jump to the next one? So um, that's my little intro 
And uh, I'm very happy to turn this over now to Dr. Megan Morero. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. So what I'm gonna talk about is um, some work that we did in 2022. And there was a lot of playing with kids in the water and nothing wrong with that. Um, but what we were looking at through this grant um, funding is really about those kids and their water literacy. Um, so as Brian said, I am a professor at Mercy College, which is actually right on the Hudson River in Dobbs Ferry, New York. We're about 30 minutes north of the city. Um, beautiful Hudson River views. But I have had students who have said they've never seen, seen the Hudson River before um, at the college. So I have like walked them across the hall and said, look outside, that's the Hudson River right there. Um, so we have some work to do basically. Um, so this was a grant that went to Mercy College Center for STEM Education, um, of which I'm the co-director and our partner was NISMIA, the New York State Marine Education Association. And shout out to our NISMIA president, Lisa, who's here today. So thank you, Lisa. Um, so why did we even need to do this? Why is this important research and work? Um, and, you know, for me, I was a science student, um, like some of you I see over there, and I realized that I really liked the education piece of this. So um, just to give you a little bit about my background, I was a high school science teacher. I developed a marine science program um, at the school I worked at in New York City. Um, and then I moved and worked for an, a tech company, did some textbook writing and curriculum writing. Um, and I, now I've been at Mercy College for, for 12 years. And I realized that I really love research, but I like it from an educational standpoint, educational research rather than scientific research. Um, I didn't, when I, I realized as an undergrad that I didn't like the lab work as I, as much as I thought I was going to. Um, but when I got into graduate school and was doing my doctorate, I love educational research and particularly qualitative research, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today because I think it gives us the stories that we want to hear. Um, so all of this is grounded in this idea of ocean literacy or water literacy. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that first. Um, so ocean literacy is a relatively new term. It's less than 20 years old, um, and it really came from this notion and this idea that we do not, we as a society, really don't know how important the ocean is in our lives. And a lot of that is because the ocean isn't really covered in K-12 very well. Um, and at the time that this all started, which was around 2005 or so, it was the ocean was pretty much ignored in existing standards. Um, and so there also weren't the same kinds of outreach programs that we have today. So now like every NSF grant has to have some broader impacts, has to have some outreach efforts and educational efforts and things were different back then. Um, so we didn't have that communication between ocean scientists and ocean educators or just science educators. Um, and so what we started to see was like a, a society that was really ocean illiterate. So didn't know enough about the ocean and didn't, um, didn't care and didn't know why it was important. Um, and so as a response to this challenge, there were a number of groups um, that came together. So the National Marine Educators Association, College of Exploration, shout out to Peter Tuttenham, who's on today, um, COSI, Lawrence Hall of Science, National Geographic. So lots of different individuals and organizations came together to talk about what is it that we think that people need to know about the ocean? Um, and it was a very transparent and inclusive process that led to um, just a process that brought everyone together, that where voices were heard, that it wasn't anyone owning this idea of ocean literacy. Um, and it brought together educators and scientists and government professionals and people in you know just different phases of their career. And so from that, the, the team developed um, this definition of ocean literacy, which I'll get to in a second, and a first guide, what we call the ocean literacy guide of, um, of what people should know about the ocean, essentially. So let's look at the definition first of ocean literacy. So ocean literacy is an understanding of the influence, the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean. Um, so how, why, you know, how do you, influence the ocean. Yes. Your slides on you're on the channel. We see the challenge slide right now. Oh, that's Just interesting. Hmm. All right. I'm gonna stop and start again. Sorry about that. Hmm. Okay. Is 
Does that work or no? Yeah, we're on, we're on ocean literacy is. Thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened, but thank you for telling me. Um, so this idea that, you know, we are influencing the ocean with our decisions every single day and that the ocean is influencing us every single day through the air that we breathe, through our weather and climate, through, you know, seafood that we might eat. Um, and so what we, when we say someone is ocean literate, we mean that they understand these, understand these essential principles and fundamental concepts. You'll see those essential principles on the left. There are seven. Um, can communicate about the ocean in a meaningful way, and then is able to make informed and responsible decisions regarding the ocean and its resources. So this, of course, came um, out of this idea of scientific literacy and you know what is it that citizens need to know about science in order to make informed decisions in their everyday lives. And we've seen in the pandemic in the last few years how important scientific literacy is. Um, so ocean literacy is basically that same idea as it applies to the ocean. So if you look at our essential principles on the left, the first one that sometimes surprises people is that the earth has one big ocean with many features, right? So we talk about ocean basins, but really they're all interconnected. Um, and these seven essential principles over um, overarch fundamental, smaller fundamental concepts, um, which tell us more specifics about some of these ideas. Um, some things that I think come into play that are kind of interesting, um, you know, that people maybe don't think about are the ocean is a major influence on weather and climate, number three. So most of our rainfall, where regardless of where you live, whether you live really far inland or you live near the coast, most of that rainfall came from water that originally evaporated from the tropical ocean, for instance. Most of the oxygen that we breathe came from you know, little photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. Um, so a lot of times people know about number five, you know, great diversity of life and ecosystems. People are sometimes interested in learning about, if you ask kids what they want to learn about, they're going to say, I want to learn about sharks, or I'm going to want to learn about whales or fish. Um, but kids also really love to learn about number seven. So that was some work that came out of uh, a study I did years ago. Kids love the idea that there's something new always something new in the ocean, that the ocean is largely unexplored. So these are wonderful entry points and hooks for teaching about the ocean. So ocean literacy is one big thing. We say water literacy in this project because it's not just salt water. Um, so there, there are other tributaries, there are other rivers and streams and other bodies of water that can be really important to kids in their communities. Um, and when we think about, let me go back for one second. So um, when you look at this idea of being able to make informed and responsible decisions, most of the time kids don't have a ton of agency around decision making, um, at least as it pertains to environmental decisions. Um, but one thing that comes up a lot with kids is around plastics. Um, so kids can decide to not use a straw or to, or to carry a reusable water bottle or to not litter or you know that kind of thing. So this also becomes a really important entry point for working with children and, and talking with kids about the types of personal decisions and family decisions that can be made in their communities. So when we think about that, the frame for this project was thinking, was considering, okay, well, what about kids who haven't had that exposure, haven't had those stepping stones that Bowser was talking about? Um, how do we get them to be ocean literate and make those informed and responsible decisions about the ocean or about their local waterways? Did my slide change this time? Am I looking at behavior change? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, understanding behavior change is actually really complex. Uh, it's not as simple as this chain here. So this idea that like we expose someone to like, oh, well, look at these cool ocean organisms. Let's go sanding. Let's do day in the life. Now we've learned something. We get some knowledge out of that, which is awesome. Um, but it's not so linear. So those stepping stones that Bowser was talking about are really important, having multiple experiences. Um, and it turns out that changing your beliefs and your emotions are better on what lead to behavior change, but it's not linear it's much more twisty turny along the way. It's not a straight up, straight line um, to from that exposure to building knowledge, to changing your beliefs. Um, and that's been a really interesting um, area of research now in ocean literacy in the last few years in particular. 
because really that crux, that final thing about making informed and, and responsible decisions is what we care about long-term. So some of you may know that we're now in the UN decade of the ocean um, for sustainability, uh, sustainable development, and behavior change is going to be really important for sustainability going forward. So if we're conserving our ocean, um, they talk about the science we need for the ocean we want. If we want a cleaner ocean, if we want an ocean with sustainable fisheries, then we need to go back and say, well, I'm going to choose to purchase only sustainable seafood. I'm going to choose to not litter. I'm going to choose to use reusable products rather than single use plastics. Um, but those are all behaviors. Those are all personal decisions that people can make. And then much larger, the bigger decisions are on a company basis on a government basis. And then all of those, of course, come into play as well. But we're, since we're looking at kids, we're looking at individual personal behaviors. Um, so credit to Dr. Emma McKinley, um, who has done a lot of the social science research around ocean literacy. Um, and you can see on the left, she's quoting, um, she pulled this from another study, um, 2019 study, where you, know, you have this idea of ocean literacy at the top and those three elements that I just talked about. So you know, understanding those essential principles, the decision making and the communication. Um, but there's all this stuff underneath that, right? So in order to be able to do that, there are these processes, there's conservation issues, there's reasons why the ocean is important. And then if you look at the right, those dimensions, those three dimensions aren't really enough, it turns out. So we have behavior and knowledge that we've been talking about, we have communication we've been talking about, but there's also these ideas about awareness and attitude and activism. And it's actually really complex to study all of this and human behavior and the decision making. Um, so this research is really interesting and it has really evolved in the last few years. Um, there's a lot of people in different continents studying ocean literacy from different perspectives, from different entry points. And um, there is now a more global ocean research community as part of the UN decade that is coming together to talk about our research agenda to talk about the types of studies that are needed, for instance, to better understand and leading to behavior change and also these other elements of ocean literacy. So that was a long-winded <laughs> backstory of why we're even looking at water literacy and why we should even care about a project like this one. So the research questions that we undertook um, were, how does participation in water literacy focused opportunities affect students' beliefs around the importance of the ocean? So that belief idea. Um, also their, uh, their own ideas about their local waterways and the relevance in their lives. And then what do students even take away from this? So I'm a qualitative researcher, which I'll explain in a minute, allows for much more open-ended um, discovery of what kids' ideas are. In this in this particular case, I wanted to have a nice open-ended question to just find out what are they getting out of this kind of work. So who are our participants? We had nine teachers who are partner teachers from our Mercy College Center for STEM Education. Um, so some of them are Mercy alumni, some of them have worked on other programs with us. And we chose them um, because they wanted, you know, self-selected that they wanted to play with us, essentially. Um, they're all five were Title I schools, that meaning that they have a high percentage of kids who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch, and that's a measure of poverty. Um, the schools were located in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Yonkers. Uh, if you don't know Yonkers, Yonkers is, I think, the second or third biggest city in, um, in New York State, and it's very urban. Um, it's, it's just outside of New York City, but it's a city unto itself, and it's a very urban area. The schools themselves were three middle schools and two high schools. And we also had a partnership with a nonprofit um, that's located here in Westchester County that's called Sister to Sister International. Um, and they're all about empowering black women. Um, so we partnered with them as well. So if you can look at our demographics, uh, our students were largely underrepresented minority students. So um, about 68% of the students that participated were, and we had over 300 students. I didn't put that on here, I uh, should have. Um, were about 68% of them were uh, Latino, Latinx. Um, you can see that, so we did ethnicity and race, but that is confusing for kids. So, you know, kids, even though demographically we're asked to separate that, a lot of kids consider themselves to be Latinx and then they don't consider themselves to be like white or black. Um, so I think this does it just skews the data a little bit. It's kind of interesting. Um, but so a lot of kids put other 
um, or they have mixed race, which is also interesting. So anyway, we had a pretty diverse group. So we engage the kids in various interventions, various uh, um, events. We were hoping that the same kids would come to a series of events, but that didn't quite happen. So um, it kind of changed up how we how we looked at the data a little bit. So in last spring, so in spring of 2022, we had two webinars, one with um, Shay Salim, who if you see her on the left, uh, Love Affair with STEM, um, she talks about her experience in the field of marine education and, and being um, the love for the ocean that she has here in New York. And so she talked about a lot about um, New York City communi ocean communication and education. Um, she talked about the Hudson River and the East River and her family. And it was just a nice opportunity for kids, first of all, to see a woman of color as a scientist speaking to them, um, but also to hear about her career path and her, her journey as it kind of interwove with some of the content, science content around, um, around our local waterways. We also had an um, Sharks of the Atlantic webinar with our partnership with the All Atlantic Blue Schools. We had schools and scientists from four different countries on that one. So it was the United States, Canada, um, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. So we had schools from all over and the kids got to hear from four different scientists and ask lots of questions and they had a lot of fun with that. Um, we also brought over 150 kids to It's My Estuary Day. So that's the picture in the middle. Um, here they are enjoying some of the exhibits at It's My Estuary Day. This is an event that's held in Coney Island each year uh, for the, about, about the last six years or so, um, where it's just an event to sort of celebrate and provide some stewardship for our waterways. In this case, it's in Kaiser Park. So there's, um, it's got like the back bay behind. Um, you'll see some pictures a little bit later, but it's a really dirty beach. Um, and so the kids did a huge beach cleanup. They did some ROV demonstrations. They got to uh, go kayaking. They got to do some seining. They got to visit some of these um, exhibitors and learn about some different programs in marine science. Um, so that was a really fun and very busy day. It was a great day to bring all those kids so all those schools were able to come to that event, which was great. Um, and then we had one of the schools did a special trip at uh, the Center for the Urban River River at Bizac in Yonkers. So you can see over here where they were engaged with some water quality work that um, they were doing. So you can see them doing some, some good science over there. We also had a group of kids, if you see at bottom left, who came to the... Um, National Marine Educators Student Conference that we held last year at Hofstra University on Long Island. So these kids had one or more of these experiences. So think of those stepping stones that Bowser's talking about. These were some of the experiences that they were um, able to be a part of. So my methods for the study were mixed methods. Um, so I did both quantitative and qualitative. The quantitative work was really around this Likert scale of ocean beliefs. Um, and this came from a study by Bidwell in 2017. His study was actually around um, a wind farm off of Block Island. And so he was using this study to understand how members of the public felt about the ocean and how to kind of get to them in terms of talking and communicating with them about the, the wind power that was happening in that area. Um, but you can see the different variables um, and that the actual items are on the right, the latent variables that kind of underpin those items on the left. So, you know, do I see the ocean? How much do I agree with this? So I see the ocean as a place of beauty. Do I see it? Um, the ocean as a place for recreation. And we changed it to waterways also. So most of our schools, actually none of our schools are right next to the ocean. Um, but for instance, our schools in Yonkers, some of them, you could see the Hudson River from their school. Um, some one of our schools in Brooklyn is not too far from the East River. Um, so we wanted to be more inclusive. So we changed it to um, instead of just ocean beliefs, more about water waterways. Then we also did so that was a pre post. And then we also did a qualitative. Um, so we gave them those items. And we also asked some um, open ended questions about just, you know, what do they think about when they think about their waterways? How important is it to their community, to their family, um, just trying to understand what they think about when they think about the ocean and whether it's important and ocean and also local waterways. Um, so they did, we did a pre-post qualitative questionnaire. That pre-post was given before they attended anything. And then after they attended 
one or more events. There weren't, weren't that many kids who actually attended more than one um, other than the webinars. And then finally, we did some focus groups, both with some of the teachers as well as some of the students. So we had, I think it was four teachers who participated in a focus group. Um, and then we had about 30 students who participated in focus groups just to get a bit more data and um, interviews. We tend to get more information out of them because people don't like to write, but they'll tell you things. Uh, so interviews are really helpful for qualitative research. Um, so let's talk about the analysis. So we just did a simple t-test to look for change um, from pre-post. And so a pair of t-tests, we were able to look at, you know, the, the same kid pre-post did their beliefs based on that I, um, that analysis change. For our qualitative analysis, um, so I'm assuming a lot of people aren't familiar with qualitative analysis. Um, this, I, this is where I fell in love with research as an educational researcher because it was so different than the scientific analysis that I was used to doing as an undergrad. Um, so qualitative analysis is very emergent. So unlike with the t-test where we're testing a null hypothesis, with qualitative analysis, we're trying, we're taking all this data. So I had interview transcripts and I had these um, questionnaires and all the kids' responses, um, and we're trying to see what is emerging from that data. So you ask questions, but your questions can actually change like your research questions along the way because you start to find things that maybe you didn't expect. So sometimes it's it is what you expect. Like if I ask kids, you know, what's interesting about the ocean, they're going to tell me animals and that's going to be unsurprising, but that could still be an emergent theme, right? Um, so we use a process called open and axial coding where you go through the data line by line and qualitative um, research does take a lot of working with your data. Um, it's also different in that you're not, unlike quantitative data where you're trying to be like very objective and separate from your your statistics and your analysis, this gives the story. This, this is the story part of, uh, of the analysis and of the findings that you get. So you go through all of this data a few times and you start to like memo, you start to write notes and, and see, oh, here's what I'm seeing in here. I'm noticing a lot of kids are saying, that they were surprised when they learned things about the Hudson River that's super close to their homes. If you live in the Bronx, like if you live in the West Bronx or you live in Yonkers, like the Hudson River is right there. That is your watershed. Um, they are, you know, so seeing some of that, when you start to see it across data sources, you start to get some, what we call exemplars. You start to get some um, examples of quotes, for instance, from the data that help us to crystallize those themes. So here are the themes that we're starting to see across the data sources. And so qualitative research, you're, you're going very deep with it. You're going through it multiple times. We call multiple passes. And we use mul um, multiple pieces of data to make sure that we're seeing those themes sort of um, it, we don't say validity and reliability, we say elements of rigor, um, where we're, we're really looking at, is this coming up a lot? Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing here? Um, and so that triangulation of different data sources is really important and a process called peer debriefing. So it was myself and um, another researcher that went through the data and then we talked about what we were seeing together um, and looked at the data again. And yeah, oh, I definitely noticed that too. I think that is a theme. You start with these like smaller themes and then you sort of collapse them together and that's your open and axial coding process. So a little bit about qualitative methods for today. Um, so our findings. The first thing we did was the t-tests because those are quick and easy. <laughs> um, and you can see just by like glancing at them that we're not seeing a big change from pre-post. So if you just kind of like look at this without even, these are just means, I should have put that, sorry. Um, without really looking and knowing exactly what this is, you're not seeing, you don't even have to run the, the stats to see like that's not a big change. The only one that we did notice um, and increase or a change, it doesn't always have to be an increase um, from pre-post was around that the ocean is a source of human culture. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I would like to delve more into that, but so like you can see that was, a, that was the only statistically significant change from pre to post um, in the kids who did this. So more on that later. Here's our, let's talk about our emergent themes that came out of the qualitative data. So theme one, was that the kids started to view, and again, these are middle and high school kids, view their waterways, the New York waterways in new ways, in different ways than they had before. Theme two 
was that we started to, the, there was increased caring about the ocean. So although we saw in the, I'm sorry, um, in the survey in like the actual statistics that their beliefs about the waterways, beliefs about the ocean didn't really change. We are seeing through their comments, through their responses to interview questions, um, that their ideas are shifting. Um, and there's definitely some evidence of that. So some examples. So um, so this is how you present qualitative findings. You give examples. So we see this theme and here are some of the quotes or some of the pieces of data um, from that theme. So these are two quotes from the teacher focus group interview. Um, so this first one on the left, some of my kids, they're 12th graders. And for some of them, the first time to go to a beach. They're urban city kids. Another teacher agreed and provided some cultural context saying the ones that actually go to the beach are the ones from the Caribbean, like Jamaican, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans. They're the ones that go to the beach, but mostly in their home country. The ones that are born here, it's the first time they've been to a beach. They didn't even realize New York has a beach. So really, this is that first stepping stone, right? That exposure that they've never had before and realizing like, there are beaches in New York. We have beautiful waters that you can go to. And if you noticed on my first slide, it was like two young women just sticking their toes in the water, following some horseshoe crabs. Like the kids were blown away that they got to see horseshoe crabs. And I'm like, wait, I see horseshoe crabs all the time. Right. Um, so that was like a really aha moment for them on the right. One of the middle school teachers is talking about the shark webinar. She says, I didn't think my kids were going to be into it because they're in eighth grade. You know, they're, you know, middle schoolers <laughs> they don't love anything. They don't admit to loving anything. Um, and she said, I guess, because they don't really get exposure like that. And so that's like a very telling that these kids haven't just haven't had that experience that this project was trying to see whether that experience actually makes a difference. Um, and so she said they, they participated, they were telling me to put stuff in the chat and questions to ask. So they were really engaged in this process to the surprise of their science teacher. Um, so this other example, so at, it's my estuary day, the kids got to go kayaking and this um, student said, I never did kayaking in my life. And I went kayaking for the first time there. I learned kayaking was pretty cool to achieve like a new skill. But the reason why I loved it so much that it was peaceful for me. And also on top of that, it was just cool being on the water. I liked it so much that I didn't even realize how deep I went in. Because when I look back, everyone was so small on the beach. I went further and further. It was just so cool to be in the water and look at the environment. So what an experience that this child got and just recognize like, wow, like, this is really important. This is now, if you think back to your ocean literacy principles, you know, the ocean, one of our fundamental concepts is about recreation and how the ocean isn't, we're not looking at the ocean in ocean literacy just from a scientific perspective, but also cultural perspectives. And so thinking about ocean in terms of human history, recreation, um, arts, right? So, so many like paintings and photography and books and movies are related to water and waterways. And this kid kind of hit that nail on the head just by having that experience in kayaking and seeing and how eye-opening that was. Um, one more, this is after the, the curb trip, the BZAC trip. Um, the student said, I just feel I am more conscious of the life that's in lots of rivers, specifically after going on the trip and being around it more of all of these fish that live in there, the smaller animals, these things that are, that are in there that made more sense. So they're learning about ecosystems in, uh, in class. This is actually an environmental science class that they're in, but going and seeing the water quality, seeing what came out of the seine net they're able to better understand and feel connected to what's happening there. Um, so this kid was able to, um, you know, to, to make that connection to, wow, like this is something new for me. Um, something that came up several times um, also under this theme, um, but I kind of see it as like a little something that stuck out to me was that a lot of kids were surprised at how clean the Hudson was. Right. So especially if you're in Yonkers, like you look at the Hudson, like the there are some nice places along the shoreline, but there's a lot of like um, factories and some of them are defunct. There's a lot of old buildings. Um, and so kids were just shocked that, wow, the water's clean. We did this water quality test and it actually is pretty nice. All right. There's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of animals that live there. And this is like a real ecosystem and it's not just our urban environment, but this is a connection to our, our community. And this is a resource that's right there in our community. So I thought that was really interesting too. Um, so theme two, we got a lot of kids saying, wow, like 
this made me care. This made me more interested. And again, really just one experience that these kids have. So it makes you more caring about your environment. These are um, post questionnaire. So as I told you, it's shorter, right? So you could see that the, the comments are much shorter than what they tell you in an interview. It makes you more caring. It made me more empathetic towards sea animals. It makes me want to keep the oceans more safe. Cleaning up the beach and seeing the plastic and the straws made me more motivated to help keep our oceans clean. So you can see, um, you could, they are making those connections. They're like, wow, like this is important. I should care a little bit about it. And just from one exposure, um, similarly, one of the teachers in the focus group said, um, they, she, she was telling the story about how they keep, keep talking to her about this recycling. Their school doesn't really recycle. We all know buildings like that, right? So their kids were getting really upset about it. Um, and so they were now after having this beach cleanup experience, they're like, this is all going to end up in the ocean. Like we need to do something. So there was a little bit of that, like movement towards decision-making and movement towards that, um, those personal decisions that kids do have some agency around. So they were definitely, uh, banging the drum toward a better, a better, um, recycling program in their school, better garbage management. So my interpretations now in terms of our discussion here, you can see some young ladies, you know, just checking out the shoreline. Um, although we didn't see an evident change in beliefs on that belief scale, I think that's, they need more exposure. Like, I think my feeling is that one experience isn't enough to change your core emotions and your core beliefs. Even if you're starting to shift your ideas, remember I showed you that like crazy wavy line, like moving to a deeper belief about the importance of the ocean in this case is not so easy. It's not just like, cool, I went to a beach cleanup for one day or cool, I got to go do some water testing or I got to go kayaking or I got to go to this conference and meet these um, scientists. So we, my feeling is like, we need more in order to affect that. So more of those stepping stones, it can't just be one. Um, and these kids, you know, they had very little previous exposure. So hearing it was almost a little bit worse than I thought. I, I don't know why as a former high school teacher, um, my students also lived very close to a bay in our case and had never been down there until I took them down there. Uh, but these kids, even though they can literally see the, the Hudson River out their windows, really didn't have any connection to it or any exposure to it. Um, but it seems that it's starting to change a little bit of their mindset and a little bit of understanding by just going down there and experiencing things, which is somewhat <laughs> positive, I would say. Um, a few other things that you know I'm thinking of and I'm connecting back to the literature, it's really, there's a huge inequity. And we know in the scientific community, there's a lot of inequity. There's a lot of um, lack of access for minorities. And you can see in, in marine science in particular, um, it's a pretty white dominated field. And so you can see some of the research behind it um, that, you know, students have interest in environmental fields and marine science as well as, as a subfield, but they're not well represented in the environmental work work workforce. There's the word. Um, so Boris Worm and some of his colleagues did a study and um, he noted that engagement in marine science has been historically a privilege of small number of people with access to higher education, specialized equipment, research funding, and such constraints have often limited public, public engagement and may have slowed the uptake of ocean science into environmental policy. So this access from a bigger perspective, from a DEI kind of perspective, this access and exposure that we're giving these kids of color is so critical. So not only from a career path, but also just from a community and an ocean literacy standpoint um, in terms of where they're going to go next. You know, so you can't move into a field you've never even heard of that you've never been exposed to, but you also, how are you supposed to make those informed and responsible decisions without having had those exposure experiences as well? So I think this is a really critical piece and that deserves a lot more research, but also deserves more funding to get those kids the exposure that kids in more privileged communities are getting um, in those experiences. So thinking that and connecting that to our idea of water literacy and ocean literacy, um, even the small proposed, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> even the small little exposures that they were having, we started to see a little bit of evidence of improved ocean literacy, right? Seeing the ocean slightly differently as an area, for instance, of 
recreation as a place to go as, as, wow, there's a lot of living things in the Hudson River. Who knew? Wow. Like we actually have a terrible impact in some ways on the ocean. Wow. That's, that's not good. And we should recycle more. So starting to move towards that, um, behavior change as well, even though we're not seeing quantitatively, and this is why the qualitative story is really important too, because we could have just done the quantitative and it's like, wow, well, this was, you know, didn't really do anything. But really when you talk to the kids and you hear in their own words and you hear from the teachers that are in the classroom every day, it is shifting, but it's going to take a bigger exposure in order for them to, to shift even more and to change in belief. So that's sort of my spiel for today. I would love to take some questions if we have time, um, but it was a fun project. So thanks for supporting us. And um, it was really interesting and the teachers were really happy too. Thank you. Questions and comments? Here? Yeah, can I? Sure. Go ahead, Lisa. No, I just want to say how very interesting that talk was, Mick. It uh, it puts a, a new perspective on um, trying to understand why uh, ocean literacy is not uh, getting infused somehow into the consciousness of today's students, and uh, and then understanding what the constraints are. And many of the constraints have been there all along for decades. So um, bringing it to the fore like this, I think makes you makes you, the teacher look at possibly look at how to arrange their scheduled time permitting and school permitting uh, um, to to create more exposure for the students at at any water body here in New York City. Yeah, I agree, and I, I a lot of the work that I do with teachers is showing them ways because our science standards even though you know there is more within the new science standards and this list um they're you know it's still very land focused and what i try to do is show teachers how you can meet this standard with ocean content um so you can still do this and you can you know for instance something that i'm doing in one of my classes um, we're looking at genetics through looking at um, whale meat in a fish market. And so they're using some of the genetic sequences and then they're learning about this idea of like, you know, the fish markets and how do you know what's really there and sustainable fishing. So it's like this interesting way to do it, but the standard is all about genetics and it doesn't have to be like the boring genetics that we all learned. Do yeah. it in a fun way. <laughs> Lisa? Oh, actually, uh, you mean me? I, I do have something oh, Lisa, else I could add. No, another Lisa one? Okay. okay. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be able to be here. I just wanted to ask you maybe, and I don't know if this is off topic, but can you comment on as marine educators or watershed educators, how we can do a better job, or maybe there are references about this, how we can do a better job about making our um, educational program more relevant to people in their daily lives? Mm. That's a great question. Um, so one place I would start is on the National Marine Educators Association site. They have a lot of work around ocean literacy. Um, there's also a new portal put out by UNESCO um, for educators um, around ocean literacy. And they're doing a great job because what they're trying to do. So we, you know, this movement started, as I said, with educators and trying to get into the science standards and um, get into classrooms. But ocean literacy with the decade has grown. And for instance, some of the work that they're doing in Europe is bringing in companies and talking to them about why they should care about the ocean, bringing in like the hotel industry and saying, this is why it's important to be a eco-friendly and ocean-friendly um, place, you know, for tourists to come. Um, we had, they had Prada being part of um, this ocean literacy movement as well. So I think they have a lot more resources where they can show how it connects to different parts of people's lives.
I'm just going to use that as like a, a quick opportunity to, um, you know, it's something that I like to do here and that I'll kind of say to the students here right, right now, which is like, if you go out in the hallway and you drink, and this isn't, this isn't appropriate for everywhere. Um, sorry, there's some noise in the hallway. Um, but if you go out into the hallway and use the drinking fountain, like, do you know where the water came from? You know, or like when you flush a toilet, like where does that water go? Um, <laughs> you know, for here, I would say for students, it's like, does anybody, does anybody feel confident they know where the water from the drink fountain is coming from? Right? And it's like, probably some of you walked over it this morning or on your way to class. Like you walked over Fall Creek, which is where your drinking water comes from. Cornell has their own corn, uh, drinking water filtration plant. It's located in the Botanic Gardens. And so... You know, just knowing that like some of those features you see around you uh, that, that you may not have known what they were, um, that, you know, those are things that are actually serving you and delivering that water to you. And it's not as if you're just taking a cup of water out of the creek, right? It has to be, it has to be treated by somebody like who's responsible for treating that water. How much money does it cost? Like, is that coming out of your tuition? Is it taxpayer dollars, right? I mean, someday everybody will pay taxes presumably um you know so like is that an investment you think worthwhile um how much you know how much does it cost to do that um because you rely on it every day now for the ocean it might be a little harder right because you, you may or you may be getting drinking water from it but probably not um but there might be features around you that are that are that way because of forces that will related to the ocean is there a burn there or some sort of flooding structure that like it seems kind of natural or just seems like it's there until you actually learn about what its function is um and you're like oh that's there because of storm surge or sea level rise like that's not a natural feature uh even though it might have grass on it or something like that like we actually build that um and it serves a purpose so i think like understanding the purpose of the things around you that you see every day uh, helps you orient yourself in the landscape and value water resources and, and what it takes to maintain them. I'll stop. No, I agree. And I think just understanding like something I always try to do with teachers and students is understanding your watershed, like what, what area of land, like where is that going? Like when, when you throw something on the ground or your oil is dripping out of your car, where does it go? And people don't even realize right that they're that connected to whatever their local body of water is um megan folks in the chat are wondering if you'll be sharing your slides later on so at any point if you can send them to me i'll make sure if anybody wants megan slides or uh, bowser slides make sure you leave your emails in the chat and i'll make sure the slides get to you thank you very much Any questions from folks here? Hey, hey, Bowser, can you can you tell us a little bit about the the, the title estuary and uh, why it matters um, as far as far north as Albany? For for those who may not understand what an estuary is, uh, or you know why 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 what happens to the ocean might might make a difference in places like Newburgh, Poughkeepsie, and, and maybe even as far north as Albany. Sure. So just as like a general overview of things, right? There's 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 even sort of like a, a commercial piece here. Like so for example, of uh you know of all the seafood that we eat. Um and, and by the way, that's probably the last link we have with real wild ecosystems is through seafood. Um, it's estimated, and I think this is either a NOAA figure or a fisheries, uh, National Marine Fisheries figure, that 40% of the seafood that we eat is connected to coastal estuaries in one way or the other, either as larval fish or the prey that feeds those fish or the shellfish that are grown in estuaries. So there's a huge connection to, 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 to food and economies that way. So uh, sometimes people think of the Hudson River as an arm of the sea because between there's a there's a dam at, at Troy, which is sort of right in the middle of New York State almost. Um, it's actually a little bit north of the capital, yeah. Albany. 
And between that dam and the Atlantic Ocean, there are no waterfalls. There's no there's no other dam. It's it's basically a gentle, slow elevation from that dam all the way to um, to New York Harbor and the Atlantic Ocean. That means that a, a place like Albany, you know, 150 miles inland is an international seaport and has been for a long, long time. So um, you can you can you can take a boat all the way from anywhere on the Atlantic Ocean, and you can just row or sail or motor that boat straight to Albany or the dam at Troy, no problem. So there's that there's that um, transportation connection as 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 well. Now, for communities that live along the river, many of those communities are there because of those reasons that we just said. Going forward, one of the really important pieces of that that estuary connection is that as we think about things like uh, climate change, sea level rise, global warming, all of those coastal com communities that are on that arm of the sea, well, as that arm flexes and changes, so are all of those coastal communities. So people in cities like Yonkers, Newburgh, Poughkeepsie, uh, Kingston, um, when we talk about sea level rise, we are also talking about neighborhood water rise. Uh, many, some of those communities in the Mid Hudson um, derive their, you know, where does your drinking water come from? I happen to be sitting here at, at in Poughkeepsie, New York, at Marist College. If I go to the drinking fountain, that water came from a few hundred yards out into the Hudson River right here in Poughkeepsie. So that if there are ocean changes, those ocean changes may extend to millions of people's homes and drinking water and, and commercial connections. And we haven't even talked about the beautiful biology of the fish, the sturgeon, the eels, the crabs, everything that's connected there. The human element of estuaries is extremely vibrant and extremely powerful. Brian, I don't know if that if if there was a if if there's a point you really wanted me to get there. Hopefully, I got something. That was great, Bob. So thank you. I mean, I think to some extent, right? I, I like how that ties into Megan your finding about culture, which is like you can know things, but you don't necessarily have to feel like they're a, a part of your identity. Um, but I mean, what happens to the water around you, like totally changes your life whether you're aware of it or not. And you, you could be aware of facts about water or facts about rivers, facts about the ocean, but you know, totally unaware and largely untaught, right? Through K through 12, nobody's telling you that like, hey, that, that river that's right out the window is where you're getting your drinking water. And you know, here's why, and here's how. Um, so you learn these abstract concepts about water, the water cycle, um, but like nobody ever puts it together for you, like out the window. Lisa, do you have a question? I see you raised your hand. Yeah, so on the cultural side of this, I would say sometimes the, uh, the connection to culture is abstract because you're, you're not seeing it right in front of you right there, the way you do the water body and the organisms. So um, what you're talking about is, is genuinely um, uh, helpful. It's very good, I guess, when you get back into the classroom and then you do further work to make those connections. I would also add that um, I just retired from the Museum of Natural History and taking uh, groups of students to this museum in particular, although there are others that show uh, cultural connections to water, to our New York waters, but going to the museum to see the connection of water through different cultures um, it is, uh, is actually quite beautiful. And uh, we've recently restored the whole of a Northwest Coast Native American. So you would see that quite readily for people connection, um, people who are on the West Coast, their connections to water. But you would also see that through other exhibitions at the museum uh, for uh, people of, on the East Coast and, and our connections to water. So I would strongly recommend trying to make the museum a part of that work. So the students would be outdoors 
seeing the the, the um, natural world connection, and then they could come indoors for a more um, um, uh, that could come indoors for a, a a cultural connection through the different cultures throughout the world. You know, also what comes to mind is um, through through climate change and recent storms, um, many cultures are on the move now. And so they, so it, it would be very interesting to study that and take a look at um, the, the cultures that are out in the middle of the ocean, let's say, um, whose uh, islands have become more submerged or totally submerged, forcing them uh, off the island as it were, uh, into other areas, other landmass areas, and to study that perspective of how climate change affects the movements of different peoples and cultures and, and how it impacts them. Definitely a huge issue. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard for kids to connect to things that are far away, but at the same time, we have local um, like just local impacts that we're, that we're seeing, right. Even whether it's in Yonkers, whether it's in the Bronx, like I live in New Rochelle, we had huge flooding from one of the storms last year. Um, and the kids remember that. And then you can say, okay, well, what if you were on an Island in the middle of the ocean, right? What is that? What would that do to your community? And right outside your door in Coney Island, a Sandy impact at Coney Island, uh, greatly and flooded uh, Seagate, for example, one community there. So um, you, you, you're right. You could examine more, um, um, examine areas that are more local, and the impact that that's had on on your neighbors and and your your relations, your family relations, who probably just live a neighborhood away, and and try to dissect that, and then from there move off to other cultures that are further away. Yeah, I see Lisa's comment in the chat uh, saying that island people and coastal people really get those uh, connections to climate change, and that's really true. We are almost at the end here. Any last questions? Thank you. <laughs> I have a last question. Megan, what would be the next research project you'd want to do if you could if you could tackle what uh, uh, another project what do you think you'd tackle oh that's tough <laughs> like i always have some new idea um something i've kind of been playing with i, I did like a pilot a couple of years ago that was really interesting um was looking at kids who do action projects who get involved in action projects for the you know for waterways or ocean um and what what motivates them, but also what holds them back. Um, and it was really interesting talking to kids who had organized a plastic bag ban or organized a skip the straw campaign. Um, and one of the things that holds them back, they said, was adults. That was one of the themes. Um, so I'd like to collect more data. I know, I, it, like <laughs> interesting, because they was talking about governments. They were talking about like managers, like some of these kids like went to restaurants and like talked to restaurant managers and they were kind of like, no, we're just going to stick with our straws, you know, um, but they have great stories to tell. And I think hearing inspirational stories of kids and trying to get at that emotional piece of like what got them there and how can we leverage that with other kids for whatever cause means, speaks to them, I think has a lot of broader applicability as well. Thanks a lot, Megan. Thanks, Bowser. Um, and thanks everybody else for coming and sticking till the end. Uh, Brian, do you have any last thoughts, comments? Uh, no, I, I'm just gonna say like one more thing just to the to the room here, but I'll wait till everybody else jumps off. But thanks, thanks Megan, thanks Bowser. Uh, thanks everybody for, for coming. For having us. Thank thanks you. Thanks Rewa for doing an amazing job putting yes. all of these pieces together. Thank you, <laughs> Hi, Bowser. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.